Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Eric Camino. I'm PPMD's uh, Vice President of Research. Um, also very excited for this session. Uh, you know, this is um, very much kind of an evolving space. We are glad that we are seeing more companies uh, start to have a focus and move into doing clinical trials with our, our Becker population, but we still have a long way to go. I think, you know, you look at the pipeline that we see for Duchenne, um, and that there's a massive number of clinical trials that are ongoing, and that is something that we obviously want to strive for um, and keep building towards. So we're very happy um, to see that there are some trials ongoing and to be joined um, by some folks to talk through the research that is happening um, currently. So we're gonna start with um, Edgewise. So Joanne Donovan's gonna um, join us to talk a little bit about Edge uh, 5506. Very good, thank you. Uh, great, we've got this up here. And I'm delighted to speak with you all today about EDG 5506, a novel approach to protecting muscle in Becker muscular dystrophy. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Edgewise, and we are a public company, so I need to tell you that uh, I am gonna talk about things that will happen in the future. And there's a lot of fine print here, I realize. We have lawyers. Um, Basically, Edgewise has been around uh, for uh, about six years, focused on developing novel uh, therapies for muscular dystrophy and rare muscle uh, disorders. Uh, we believe that this investigational compound that we have developed could be used alone or potentially in combination with other therapies as well, regardless of mutation. And that's really a key to this approach, that it's regardless of mutation. Now, you've heard a lot about that Becker muscular dystrophy is a serious dystrophinopathy, it has serious consequences. Uh, it does have a variable uh, clinical course, uh, we've heard. And what we do know is that once muscle starts to be lost, once individuals' functional capabilities are lost, the muscle's gone. It's not coming back and they're on a path to continuing to lose muscle and ultimately lose function, um, the really, with the disease progressing. And that leads to, we hear from the community that living with Becker has a lot of challenges. They're actually different challenges than, than potentially families with young kids. Um, you know, there's a lot of adults. They, these people have lives to live, they're working. It's very different in terms of clinical trial landscape than in Duchenne. So we are trying to listen to that and adapt our clinical trials uh, to uh, make them more uh, appropriate for uh, adults uh, with Becker. Um, the key to, and you've heard a lot about protecting the muscle and how the muscle gets injured. In both Becker and Duchenne, the contraction of the muscle induces injury. That's the fundamental problem in the muscle. And it's particularly in one type of muscle fibers, the fast muscle fibers, which are about half the muscle fibers. And that is a key part of the disease process. And we believe that if we can modulate that, if we can affect that, uh, we can protect muscles from contraction-induced injury. And I'm gonna show you some data on that. Um, right now, we have uh, three studies uh, ongoing uh, in the United States. Uh, the ARCH study is a 24-month open-label study. I'll show you data for 12 months. We just released that earlier this week. Uh, that uh, includes uh, adults, men who were in our phase one Becker uh, trial and who continued on uh, in the open-label along with others. The Canyon study uh, is a study, a placebo-controlled study in adolescents and adult uh, with uh, Becker that is currently enrolling in the United States and Europe. Uh, and the LINK study is an initial study in uh, ambulatory boys with Duchenne. You've heard a lot about the spectrum. We're looking at the whole spectrum here. So the concept is that some muscle fibers are more susceptible to injury because of the lack of functional dystrophy. So we've made EDG 5506 designed to protect these more susceptible muscle fibers. And we have lots of animal data. I'm not really gonna show you all that animal data. You would be bored. Um, to protect, that shows that it protects susceptible muscle fibers and can prevent long-term damage uh, in the muscles. Now, 
You, Anamika spoke today. You've heard other ways of describing what does dystrophin do. And we think about muscle fibers here that are contracting. Yep, there we are. They are contracting all at once. And the dystrophin is, is schematically here, the green. What it does is it, is it links muscle fibers together so they're supported when they contract. Because it turns out that muscle fibers don't contract all at once like this. The nerves send impulses that selected muscle fibers contract. And so now this muscle fiber here needs to be is supported by the other muscle fibers. But when dystrophin is lacking, that muscle fiber is all on its own, basically. It's contracting and it doesn't have the support across the muscle. And then when that muscle fiber is on its own, it's susceptible to damage. So um, that is the, the basic problem uh, in Duchenne. So what we're trying to do is to, because contraction causes excessive uh, damage, fast fibers are injured. And basically, if we protect muscle, we can potentially preserve function. Now, the one animal thing I am going to show you, this is a photomicrograph of um, a mouse finger muscle. It's small enough that you can see it under the microscope. And these are both in MDX animals, so they are both dystrophic animals. On the left, this is, these are, are these moving? Yeah, this, this is moving. You can see contraction leads to these visible changes. These muscle fibers are basically getting getting disrupted by the force of the contraction. And it's the full force of contraction that's disrupting them. You heard before, in terms of exercise, it's the extreme exercise that's what's damaging the muscle. So EDG 5506, when it's pre-incubated, the muscle's still contracting, but the contraction doesn't cause the visible damage. It completely protects against that visible damage. What happens when the muscle is damaged, whoops, this way, is that they, in, they release muscle protein biomarkers. So that you know, you've heard about CK being elevated. There are a whole lot of different muscle uh, proteins that are released into the bloodstream, and we can follow those to understand damage uh, to uh, in a clinical trial. Uh, and we followed all of these uh, muscle proteins. So we are looking at both Becker and Duchenne uh, in the clinic, as I mentioned, because it is a spectrum of disease and we can learn one from the other. So we can look at boys with Duchenne and understand more that will ultimately help us um, with uh, dosing and with understanding how to dose boys with Becker as well. So one of the, the um, assessments that's used in clinical trials is the North Star Ambulatory Assessment. And what that is, is a 17 different measures. And they are more or less measures that are in everyday life. So things like standing, things like walking, getting up from a chair, climbing a single stair, climbing up, climbing down. So the idea is to look at something that is meaningful in, for daily life. And that has been used in a number of natural history studies uh, to date, and it is used by some clinic by practitioners uh, with, uh, uh, in uh, men with uh, Becker. And we have interesting colors up here, I'm noticing. <laughs> I don't know what that, oh, sometimes that's this. No, that's not working. So in, um, this is uh, some information from a natural history study in Italy. And basically what this is, this is, I realize, a complicated uh, graph, but it shows us a lot. And basically, this shows the North Star on the vertical axis. And it also has the points that are colored. They're changing over a year, what happens to men over a year. And the colors, were the colors to show up nicely, the green is at the top. They are far less fat in the muscle. The muscle is intact. And as the, there is less and less uh, muscle, there's more fat, they have less function in terms of the North Star. The point value goes down. And what you can see here, importantly for a clinical trial, is that if muscle is intact, then it tends to stay intact, that it doesn't change over a year. But when uh, 
men have already lost muscle, they tend to progress. And again, Craig mentioned they lose an average of about 1.2 points per year over five years uh, in the, the Italian trial. So that helps us in terms of designing a clinical trial. The folks that we that were enrolled in the current clinical trial have a North Star of about 15. So they're clearly in this area where they are, are declining. So we did a phase one study to look at safety, um, looks at how um, EDG 5506 is given. It's an oral tablet given once a day uh, and can be taken with or without food. Uh, it gets to the muscle. We were able to show that there is 100 times more drug in the muscle than there is in the bloodstream. So it's where it needs to be. And we now have looked at the biomarkers of muscle uh, damage over 12 months. And over 12 months, we see CK dropping significantly. It drops the first month. It stays down significantly. And um, this is, so it's 37% down over a year. And a marker of the fast muscle fibers, the more susceptible ones, that's down just about 80% over a year. Again, it drops fast. So it shows that if you take the drug over that, e that year, it, is, it has a sustained effect. And presumably, it goes back to the hypothesis that if you prevent muscle fibers from damage, then they remain intact and it can preserve function and even allow regeneration as well. So what we saw in terms of function was that with the North Star and that, that scale of 17 uh, measures, um, that what we would have expected over the year to have them go down by about 1.2 points. Um, and what we saw was there, we're looking at different data points over the year. We measured it multiple times. And consistently, we saw the, the blue line is actually the average of all of the, or the, the linear regression of all of the data points over a year. And it's stable or trending towards improvement, actually, which is very encouraging. Now, this isn't the kind of thing where we can go to the FDA and say, look, we want to get approval for this drug. We need to do a larger trial to show that. And we need to do a placebo control trial, because that's the kind of data that they want to see. So we have an ongoing study, uh, Canyon, a phase two study. And that is looking in adolescents and men with Becker, uh, age 12 to 50, with a genetic diagnosis, a, a mutation in the DM, the Duchenne, the, uh, the dystrophin gene. And they are ambulatory. That came up before, is can we look at a broader group of, of men in the trial? And the reason we're looking at ambulatory men within a certain North Star range is because we can see a change over the year. We can power a study so that we are able to get what we all want is to see a successful trial to be able to, to hit an endpoint and go back to the FDA and say, look, this is something that you should approve. Um, we are, this is 12 months of treatment. Um, we, uh, a, a uh, uh, to preview, we've actually reduced the number of site visits because we now have more information on the safety uh, of the drug. So we're able to reduce the number of site visits. Uh, we are looking at a, um, a number of functional assessments. We're looking at MRI, uh, and we are not doing any muscle biopsies in this study. Uh, we are increasingly looking at uh, at-home measures and um, we are looking at sites across the country. There's actually um, uh, sites that are newly opened and trying to get it to where people can come to the sites without excessive travel, basically. We are, as I mentioned, also attentive to making sure people are able to travel without a financial burden uh, to provide those kind of support services, concierge services. Um, and, as I said, to get more sites uh, to be able to ease the travel burden. Um, so, to, in summary, uh, we uh, are looking at EDG 5506, both for Becker and for Duchenne, uh, taken orally, intended to preserve uh, and uh, protect the muscle to allow even improvement of function in Becker and Duchenne patients, regardless of, of mutation. 
Um, the goal is really to protect the muscle uh, and the susceptible uh, muscle fibers, either alone or in combination uh, with other therapies. It could be used on top of dystrophin uh, replacement uh, therapies, and to really go to where the damage starts, that fundamental process there. So that's where we are. Uh, serious dystrophinopathy, this is what I've, I've, I've told you. Um, lots of challenges we understand uh, for those living with Becker that, that uh, we hope to try to uh, address uh, and uh, improve things. Contraction-induced injury is key, and that's what we are going. You heard a lot about exercise and not pushing too far. That's basically what this drug is doing. It's taking the edge off the contraction so that you are not pushing too far and causing damage to the muscle. So, but doing it every day consistently, every hour of the day. Uh, and what we've seen is that muscle bi biomarkers are reduced, and we see trends towards improvement uh, in, uh, in uh, function as well. So got studies underway, more to come. We just announced an expansion of the phase two study uh, for a potentially pivotal study, and you'll be hearing more about that. Thanks. Thank you for that, Joanne. Um, our next speaker is gonna be Paula Clements um, to talk about the um, study with Vimorolone and Becker. Um, it's for the FDA um, partially funded, su supported. Yes. Um, supported by yeah. grant from the FDA. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paula Clemens. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and I'm leading the study for testing Vimorolone in Becker muscular dystrophy, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, it's a placebo-controlled blinded study that's enrolling currently, so I won't have any data to show you, but um, I'd like to show you some of the data uh, in the Duchenne trial uh, since that data has been has gone all the way through uh, a phase three study and is before the FDA um, with probably a decision this fall. Um, and then introduce you to the Becker study. And I also, um, I brought with me flyers both for physicians and for um, patients. So after the session, I encourage you to pick up flyers to give to people you know who have Becker um, or, to, or to give to physicians who might, be, um, might have Becker patients. So, so these are my disclosures. So um, just a little bit about Vimorolone. You heard, heard it come up in a number of the questions. Um, it's a type of steroid, but it is not a glucocorticoid, so we call it a first-in-class dissociative steroid. So it shares some of the chemical characteristics, the ring structure uh, of, stero of all steroids. Um, we have lots of steroid hormones in our bodies, um, but it has some critical differences that have um, been introduced in, in generating Vimorolone to, um, to try and diminish the side effects. So it, um, and in a lot of um, preclinical studies, which we won't show you today, uh, it basically keeps the, uh, the, the beneficial aspect of steroids, which is uh, in, inhibiting a signaling molecule called NF-kappa B, which is a key signaling uh, inflammatory um, molecule in our bodies. Um, so it inhibits that and therefore it um, reduces the inflammation. Um, and that is the beneficial effect that we see from steroids in the dystrophinopathies. Um, but it, it has lost other characteristics um, which are designed to limit the side effects that we see with, with long-term steroids. Um, and in the, um, in the Duchenne studies, which is where we have experience so far, we see that it has really uh, a remarkably less effect on the bone so that, that the, the boys in the Duchenne studies have continued to have normal growth characteristics. And, and even in ones that have 
switch from prednisone to, in, in the middle of a study, from prednisone to vomorolone, they actually retain, they, they regain their, their growth potential. Um, there's also some other bone biomarker studies that, that are um, encouraging. Um, of course, it's all very early days, right? And a lot of the chronic effects of steroids are, are over long-term treatment, so, so um, really time will tell with that. Um, but the initial uh, data is pretty encouraging. So I'm just going to um, jump to some of the uh, outcomes in the, in the um, Duchenne trial. Uh, so this was set up with a uh, primary um, clinical outcome in the, uh, in, the, in the pivotal study that was um, randomized and uh, placebo and prednisone controlled. What I'm showing you here is vomorolone against placebo. Um, the primary endpoint was a time to stand, and uh, you can see, and let's see, this is, this is, there's probably a pointer in here somewhere, right? But, oh, here we go. There we go. Um, so <clears throat> these um, lower uh, sort of black circles is the placebo, um, and then uh, vomorolone was, was in two different doses. So there's sort of a six milligram per kilogram dose in light blue and a two milligram per kilogram dose in, in gold. Um, and you're looking over a 24 week period here. And so you can see that there's um, uh, better performance uh, in this time to stand uh, with the vomorolone than with placebo. And then there were a series of secondary endpoints which were um, which also showed uh, improvement, and you can see that in, um, in the other graphs here. And then finally, um, uh, as well, in some of these other exploratory outcomes, which was that NS uh, North Star Ambulatory Assessment that folks have, have mentioned, uh, as well as the time to climb four steps. So overall, just to give you a summary of the studies of vomorolone in, in Duchenne, um, we saw functional improvement or st stabilization in open-label studies going up to 30 months, um, and um, usually a very good sign of um, in any study is that um, patients stay in it for, for, for the long haul, um, um, because of course in any clinical study, um, participants can, can choose to withdraw at any time for any reason. Um, so there was a high percentage that, that completed the trial over 30 months. That was the open label study. Uh, then when we went then in the controlled study, uh, there was um, uh, statistically significant and clinically relevant functional improvements um, uh, with both placebo and prednisone comparator studies. Um, it's been, been quite safe and well tolerated. And as I mentioned earlier, it, it preserved the uh, growth trajectory of, of treated boys. So I'm gonna shift gears now to, um, to Becker. And uh, uh, there's a pair of scientific uh, researchers, Allison Fiorello and, and Chris Heyer at um, Children's National, um, who have generated a Becker mouse um, and this has been a, um, this is not something that the field had. We had a variety of Duchenne models. Um, and uh, here we're just showing uh, that, um, oops, sorry. Wow, that went quick. Um, <laughs> uh, that um, by uh, Western blot that, that they have, uh, you know, a, a reduced but present dystrophin compared to wild type mice as opposed to no dystrophin in MDX mice. And uh, this um, has uh, been a, a model in which they could test both, both prednisone and vomorolone. Um, and of course, in mice, we're not as worried about the side effects, so we can see about um, dystrophin preservation. Uh, and in this model, there was a uh, Good dystrophin preservation with both prednisone and vomorolone, and so and an improvement in in the um, uh, in the muscle histology. 
So I'm just going to tell you a little, just some key points about the, uh, the, the Becker study that we're currently doing. Um, it is, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a pilot study, so it's a small study, um, it, but it is placebo-controlled um, and blinded. Um, what I'm showing here are sort of the key inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so we're uh, uh, enrolling adult men. Um, and uh, we are putting a, a, their ambulatory and putting sort of a functional, a set of functional guidelines on um, inclusion so that, as others have discussed, we get um, a, a section of sort of a, a slice of the Becker phenotype um, in w that will be homogeneous enough to see a change if there's a benefit and also um, it's sort of that slice that we would expect by natural history that they might be slowly declining over that period. It doesn't mean that this would be the only um, uh, sort of part of Becker muscular dystrophy that would ultimately benefit from treatment. It just means that this is a slice that you can, can show an, a beneficial effect if there is one. Um, and then we have some of the usual exclusions just to keep it safe for participants. So of course, with any early study, our primary objective is safety and tolerability in the Becker population. Um, we are looking at pharmacokinetics and uh, some of the pharmacodynamic uh, responses. So pharmacodynamics are basically looking at those serum biomarkers to see what will um, uh, bridge to either sensor, uh, uh, safety outcomes or, or efficacy outcomes ultimately. Uh, and then we have clinical efficacy as an exploratory objective, but of course uh, it's a very important one. We are actually doing optional muscle biopsies um, to look at uh, um, dystrophin induction in muscle because there's reason to believe from preclinical studies that um, by uh, by inhibiting the inflammation in muscle with uh, vomorolone um, that uh, you will preserve some of that truncated dystrophin um, that is present. So this is just a basic outline of the study. We've, we've added a, um, a pre-screening phase because we are enrolling participants from across the country. There is uh, travel support provided. Um, and, but we, um, we are, have a pre-screening um, kind of Zoom call where we consent people to pre-screen so that we can obtain some initial information to determine that they'll be eligible, essentially their genetic results and their echocardiogram results. Um, but, uh, and then it's followed by a typical screening period where we assess eligibility, uh, followed by the treatment period, and again, it's a two-to-one randomization drug to um, placebo, uh, followed by a, uh, a tapering uh, period. And I'm gonna conclude with, uh, this was really a whole um, family of supports for the Vomorolone program, so we always love to show this, um, really a whole host of organizations, PPMD included, um, have supported the Memorial Loan Program over, over the long haul. Um, the uh, Memorial Loan was initiated by um, Reveragen, um, then um, licensed by Synthera. Um, Synergy, the Cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group, has been a key component. And for this pilot study, we have two sites, the University of Pittsburgh and then the University of Padova in Italy. Um, our statistician is listed there as well. Um, University of Pittsburgh's been enrolling over the past 12 months and, and been really encouraged with how that's been going. We've really been enrolling at a steady clip. Uh, and the Italian site is nearing regulatory approval to start enrolling. So, all right, I'll stop there. Thank you, Paula. Um, and our next speaker, or final speaker for this session before we move to the questions is Claudia Senesak. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm 
happy to be here. Um, as you can see, I'm from the University of Florida. And <laughs> I'm the project manager for the um, imaging uh, study at the University of Florida. So I wanted to share some information with you today from the Imaging Neuromuscular Disease Natural History Study. So first of all, I wanted just to give a plug on why natural history studies are important. And this particular study is an MRI study, and so this is one of the first MRI studies that is mapping the progression of Becker muscular dystrophy. This study will help guide future clinical trials uh, for pharmaceuticals and BMD, and will help determine new drugs if new drugs are working well. This is uh, the first study to examine MRI and muscle biopsies to determine if one of those measures would be uh, more beneficial than the other in future clinical trials. Natural history studies help drug companies plan effective clinical trials and can help them optimize their trial design. So what do we know about um, Becker muscular dystrophy in terms of therapeutic development? And you've heard this from the other speakers. We know that Becker muscular dystrophy has a slower disease progression. We know that there is a smaller population of individuals that are affected by Becker muscular dystrophy. We know that there is um, a high variability in the phenotype, and we know that there's heterogeneity between and within muscles individuals that have this disease. There are few natural history studies, um, but that's changing. Magnetic resonance imaging, oh, the colors are interesting, aren't they? Um, <clears throat> I guess we can't do anything about that. Okay. So magnetic imaging, um, residence imaging, and biomarkers for muscular dystrophy started many years ago. So we've been doing this for at least 15 years. And we started with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, mapping the progression of um, DMD. And um, we have had over 15 hundred subject visits. We've looked at functional data and we've looked at MR data. And some of our subjects have come uh, for over 12 years. This was a multi-centered study. We had sites at CHOP in Philadelphia, OHSU in Portland, and of course the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. And we um, shared our data and helped um, in the design of many clinical trials. We were able to use um, muscle fat fraction as a measure of disease progression. And this has helped guide us as we've progressed over these 15 years in, oops, how do I go back? Oop, there we go. So, um, we're using MRI and spectroscopy in these, uh, in these, okay, careful, Claudia. All right, so um, with our spectroscopy, I'll try it this way. With spectroscopy, you can probably see a rectangular shaped box that's placed here, and it's actually placed in soleus. Um, and it gives us a readout of the water content and the fat content in that muscle. We take that and we make a water image and we make a fat image, and then we come up with a derived fat fraction map. Um, from that, it gives us an idea of um, a measure of disease progression. 
if we look at that, and we looked at this very carefully because we had three sites, and each site was using a little bit different MRI. So we wanted to be carefully, and we wanted to look very carefully to make sure that we had really high reproducibility and, and sensitivity. And you can see from this that we did, we were able to demonstrate that. So now we wanted to be able to show that in Becker muscular dystrophy. So when we did that, I'll just refresh your memory over here. This is a slice that's taken from the thigh. This is the femur, just to get you oriented. This is the femur. These are the quadriceps. This is vastus lateralis. This is going to be the hamstrings in the back. So here's this rectangular box referred to as a voxel. This is where we're going to take our spectroscopy. We've been able to do that very consistently in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We came over, here's our subject with Becker muscular dystrophy. And what we found was, and just to give you an idea, the red that you see in this image is the contractile tissue. And the green is more the fat. When we went to place our voxel in vastus lateralis, we found that in this particular individual, there was just a very thin slice of contractile tissue left in this person's vastus lateralis. And what we found is that there was an inability to be consistent with our voxel placement. So we have moved to an imaging-based approach in terms of placing where that voxel is to get consistent data. So now we're in our, um, in our current funding cycle, and we're looking at MR biomarkers in muscular dystrophy. We're continuing with our Duchenne cohort. We have now added Becker muscular dystrophy. We're using localized Im imaging and um, quantitative whole body imaging, looking at fat fraction again. Down in this image, this is an image of our whole body imaging. And you can see the lower leg, the thigh, um, the pelvis, and the trunk. And these are corresponding images taken from those sections. We're also imaging respiratory muscles in this study. We're looking at inflammation with transverse relaxation time. We're also collecting uh, functional data as we have all along with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we're doing a one-time muscle biopsy, a needle biopsy in Becker muscular dystrophy. We're characterizing arm muscles. We're really putting a lot of emphasis on subject comfort while they're in the MRI. It's really important they're in there for at least an hour. Um, and so it's really important that they're comfortable while they're in there. You can't get good images if you have someone that's moving around and shifting their position while they're in the MRI. It's just like taking a photograph and if the person moves, the image is gonna be blurry. This is our baseline data um, on this particular um, cohort. You can see we still continue with our uh, Duchenne cohort. We have 45 in the ambulatory arm of this, 32 subjects in the non-ambulatory uh, arm. And then with our Becker muscular dystrophy subjects, right now we have 42 ambulatory subjects and seven non-ambulatory subjects and five, so far, five controls that are matched uh, with the Becker muscular dystrophy subjects. Also depicted in this slide, just um, means for age range, weight, height, pull scores, upper extremity Brooks score, six minute walk test, the 10 minute walk run. The North Star for the Duchenne group and the NSAID for the Becker muscular dystrophy group. 
Some of our functional data um, in this particular slide, um, our functional endpoints are the six minute walk, functional time test, the NSAID, the 100 meter walk, the Brooks score for upper extremity and lower extremity, performance of the upper limb, and pulmonary function test. In this slide in the dark blue is our ambulatory uh, subjects with Becker muscular dystrophy. This particular graph here is our NSAID, and this is our non-ambulatory group. There's a significant drop um, between the two groups. Over here is our pull, our pull scores, ambulatory, non-ambulatory, again, a significant drop in scores. Uh, the maximum score on the poll is 42. And then this is the Brooks score. So you can see, again, there's a significant difference there. The ambulatory subjects, the only thing different about this slide is just that I'm reporting the six-minute walk distance for our ambulatory subjects with Becker muscular dystrophy, 360 meters plus or minus 127 meters, and the 10-minute walk run, 7.8 seconds plus or minus four seconds. I wanted just to show some images because I think, you know, picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I could stand up here for a long time and just talk about what we see in the images, but when you see the images, it's, um, it's pretty impressive. So um, all of these images are taken of men that have Becker muscular dystrophy. And we've already said that the heterogeneity is, is quite variable, and I think these images show you that. Just to get you oriented, these are taken from the upper leg, so you see the femur in the center, quadriceps on top, hamstrings um, lying underneath. You'll see that the age is listed, their distance for the six-minute walk test, their lower extremity Brooks score, and the NSAID. The maximum score on the NSAID is 54 out of 54. This person is 18 years old. This person is 28 years old. Again, just refresh your memory. The red that you see in these images is the contractile tissue that um, is present. This person is 32 and then 44 and 62 years old. All of these individuals are ambulatory. So um, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability. The next, these are the same individuals in the same order. And this is in the lower leg, so just to get you oriented again, this is the tibia, this is the fibula, anterior compartment, lateral compartment, and then our calf muscles with gastrocnemius, soleus, and our deeper um, posterior compartment. So again, 22 years old, 18, oops, so sorry. <laughs> what did I do? Okay, here we are. Um, push the right button. 18 years old, 28, 32, 44, and 62. Again, all ambulatory subjects. And then again, same subjects. Um, this is looking at arm muscles. Again, just getting you oriented to what the, what's in the image. This is the humerus, biceps sitting on top, tricep sitting underneath. Now we're looking at the pull score and an upper extremity Brooks score. And again, 18 years old, 40 out of 42 on the pull, 28 years old, 40 out of 42, 32 years old, 35 out of 42, 44 years old, 22 out of 42, 
and then 62 years old, 42 out of 42. So I think the images really um, just give you a lot of information that you can't get when you're just looking at functional data. So we're correlating all of this data uh, continually. Oops. Oh gosh. <laughs> Let's try it this way. We are collecting data on um, respiratory muscles in this study. And so, and the colors are just crazy up here. This is really black and white. <laughs> so, <laughs> you'll just have to trust me, this is a black and white image right here. Um, we are looking at the oblique muscles, the abdominals that are the oblique muscles and rectus abdominis. The diaphragm is very difficult to image. It's a very, very thin muscle, so we're not able to get that on the MRI. Ah, okay, here we go. Okay, I'm wrapping up right here. Okay, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse, rectus abdominis. Um, over here, this is someone with Becker muscular dystrophy. We're finding that internal oblique is almost completely infiltrated with fat. Um, I'm going to the next slide right now. <laughs> She's cracking the whip. <laughs> um, this just gives you an idea, internal oblique, external oblique. They're both infiltrating with fat, so we're losing abdominals rather quickly and early on in this. This gives you an idea of what muscle groups are infiltrating quickly with fat, and then the next slide, one of my favorites, variability across subjects with BMD. This is just a stark reminder of this heterogeneity across subjects. I'm almost done, I swear I am. Okay, the imaging, <laughs> the imaging neuromuscular disease study. Um, how can you participate? Inclusion criteria, diagnosis of Becker muscular dystrophy. We're recruiting men between the ages of 18 and 62, ambulatory and non-ambulatory. You have to be medically stable. We do have some exclusion criteria. Um, if you have an internal defibrillator or a pacemaker, if you're on a ventilator full time, if you have back pain and you can't lie in the MRI for an hour, um, severe contractures that can't be accommodated for the MRI, contraindication to being in the MRI, like metal in your body that's not compatible with the MRI, you don't wanna go in there. Um, secondary neuromuscular disease like cerebral palsy. Uh, study protocol, three visits, baseline, two annual visits, uh, would include MRI, functional testing, blood and urine samples, pulmonary function test. I already mentioned the biopsy, one time muscle biopsy, second visit. We pay for your travel and accommodations. You're also paid a stipend. We share all of the data that we collect with you, um, including images, function, and the biopsy results. I'm almost there, I swear. Make an investment in your healthcare and your family. They want you around for a long time. Learn as much as you can about your disease. You help guide research into the future. We can't do it without you participating. You're the most important team member. Thank you, Claudia. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, I am gonna just start with one uh, with you, Claudia, because I didn't see this in the inclusion exclusion. If uh, a patient is participating in one of the other trials with an investigational product, are they allowed to participate in the imaging DMD That's study? That's a really good question, and um, that is not an exclusion criteria. Okay. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. uh, question back there from Sue. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, great presentations. Claudia, quick question. If I remember the um, images correctly, the bottom right 62-year-old man, 
there seemed to be some discordance between lower extremity infiltration, but pretty preserved upper body. And the others seemed to, again, it was quick, but it, others seemed to be a little bit more concordant. It is, are you finding that there's some difference between upper body and lower body, a little bit of heterogeneity? Uh, it's a really good question, and I can tell you that um, we're not seeing a real pattern yet. Uh, there's just a lot of variability. The jury's still out. Um, Mena in the back. In the meantime, while she's running that, for the, uh, the two investigational product studies, do we have open label extensions available for EDG and Vomor alone? For uh, Vomor alone, not, not yet. We're actually hoping to do that, but we're just sort of in discussion with all the partners. That is it. Uh, yes, that's it, actually in process getting that um, out to and, and started. And the uh, open label study that's ongoing that I showed you is out to 24 months. So our intent is to keep going there. Thank you for those images. They were really remarkable. Any thought, or maybe I missed it, of using those type of images in the drugs that we're talking about here today to look at their effects? Yes, I'm going to hand it right over here. Yes, we are uh, working with imaging DMD in the Canyon study. So that this is, it's a very exciting way of trying, to, of understanding what a drug does because um, the function is variable and you may see changes in MRI even without seeing changes in function. So we think it's very valuable and have incorporated it. And we are also uh, encouraging folks who are in the Vomorolone study to participate in the imaging BMD study. I, I just had a question. Do you know the mechanism of the drug that you're, how does it protect you? Yeah. So what it does is it targets the fast myosin. So the, it basically takes the edge off the contraction. So what we have found with and shown with those mouse is that if you inhibit contraction even by 10%, which isn't something that you would feel in everyday function, you can protect against the damage. So it's the difference between climbing a mountain and your, your muscles are sore the next day because you've been extreme versus operating every day at 75%. So it partially, it very it slightly inhibits the contraction of the fast myosin. You still have the slow myosin. And we, what we've done is looked at things like strength measures. Those don't change. A question. Uh, do you have an understanding of, uh, you mentioned that it sort of almost seems to concentrate in muscle, the drug does. Like, what is the mechanism of that? That, that is actually um, straightforward. Because it binds so tightly to fast myosin, it targets that. It really doesn't bind to anything else. And so it is, you know, 99% of it in the body is in the, in the muscles. So since a uh, major part of uh, the functional decline is that contraction-based injury inhibiting repair and uh, recovery, um, if that is inhibited enough, would it be possible to uh, actually allow those muscles to recover and potentially regenerate? There is, you know, the muscles do have, have stem cells. They have satellite cells that, that do divide. Um, it, this, so there is that potential. Um, I think as Anamika uh, said this morning, even with things like gene therapy, we don't expect that to restore muscle volume to what it was. Um, but it, it does explain that you may see in increases, you may see improvements as well. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I do want to say, though, I mean, I think we're at a kind of a very exciting time for this, seeing things like animal models being developed for Becker populations. We have a few natural history studies. We obviously want more um, so we can address some of these gaps and we're excited to have a few companies in the space exploring this and over the past few years or you know we've seen some companies come into the space we're hopeful to see more um, I think it's also 
you know, as we continue to explore this, hopefully we can share what we're learning across the different companies so we can develop trials and get over kind of some of the hurdles that we see in clinical trial design with, with the Becker population. Um, so I wanna thank you all for coming and, and talking about the research that you have ongoing and our speakers from the previous session as well for coming and sharing with all of us. Um, and thank you all for joining us today for this session. Thank you.